Okay, students, welcome to uh, chapter five. Um, we're doing freedom and justice uh, this week. So uh, we're going to talk about what it means to, in a system, especially like our democratic system, um, such as the one we have in the United States. And when I say democratic, I'm talking about small d, not political party. Um, in a democratic system, um, there's levels of freedom, right? Um, what, when we talk about freedom, we are talking about freedom of movement, freedom to say what we want to say. Um, we're talking about the ability to uh, speak what's uh, freedom of speech. But but is it is our freedom of speech um, like is the freedom of speech where it's it's you can just say whatever you want. You can you speak. Can you say bomb in a crowded room? Can you uh, say or a crowded airport? Can you say bomb in a crowded theater um, or a fire in a crowded theater? Any, any of those things you can cause harm to somebody else. So so freedom. So even though we have freedom, um, do we is it unlimited? And we can argue, we can all say probably more than likely no. Um, when we talk about freedom, we're talking about definitions of freedom. Um, so we want to really like look at what is what is the definition of freedom. Um, definitions of freedom is uh, uh, freedom and liberty are interchangeable terms. At least some people seem to think that. So um, when we have freedoms, we have these liberties, uh, these rights, right? Uh, civil liberties. Um, but do but is that always true? Uh, some people, some theorists, some political theorists will argue yes, they are interchangeable. Others will argue they're not. So when we're talking about uh, these these terms, we're we're talking about uh, they sometimes can be interchangeable. Sometimes they're not. So uh, we're gonna just delve into this a little more. So when we talk about definition of freedom. Freedom and liberty are interchangeable terms. Freedom like democracy is essentially a contested concept. So everyone tends to, uh, some people argue democracy and democracy is not always the same thing. Um, a reasonable starting point though is to define freedom as the absence of constraints. So as you can see in the picture, you see the constraints being broken, right? However, the subject is more complicated than, than just uh, the removal of these constraints. Um, so when we talk about uh, different types of, of constraints, there's the physical constraint, right? Um, where, uh, which is, that is the most obvious form of constraint. Um, how, we, how do we physically constrain people? Well, we grab it, we grab them and hold them. We will, um, we will, we will, uh, you can cuff them, you can put them in a, 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 a cell, a cage or whatever. Uh, physical incapacity is a constraint, but it is the only related to freedom in our sense if, for example, a disabled person is denied access to resources that could improve their quality of life. Um, that's also a form of constraint, not being able to have access. Um, if you look at this, vid this video, you'll see the uh, closed caption. If someone is hard of hearing, then, and they take this course and there's no closed caption, how will they be able to, how will they be able to pass this course or even uh, understand the lecture, right? Because I am, I have intentionally typed out the, a lot of my lecture, but I do do, I do it add-ons. Like right now I'm talking to add-ons. I'm not, uh, you do a little, you kind of, so, if you if you um, are like taking this course and you miss the lecture, let's just say it's an in-person class and you miss the lecture. Well, you can go back and look at it. And now, like I said, I'm not saying word for word what's on the what's on the uh, PowerPoint, but I am uh, I am giving you guys an, an overview, right? And I'm and all of this all of this is in the in the textbook um, in chapter five, right? So. And so we have different um, theorists who say different things like John Jacques uh, Rousseau have, uh, have uh, basically discussed freedom concerning moral uh, conduct or rationality. So only the moral or the rational can genuinely be free according to Rousseau. This is a highly, it's, a, it's highly controversial because um, 
what is morality? <laughs> you know, now we can say some of us can argue morality is based on the uh, uh, based on our ideology. What is your ideology based on? Well, a lot of people's ideology is based on religions. Others is not. <laughs> you know, some people have um, belief systems that are not necessarily rooted in religion, which means they might not necessarily uh, not have morals because morals and religion are not necessarily mutually uh, exclusive, right? So we uh, have to be aware of that and, and understand that some people will uh, have morals but not have a religion and believe in a higher cult being. Uh, or somebody might, somebody might belong to a religion that has multiple gods, right? Higher beings. So it, it just depends. Um, when we talk about constraints on freedom, we're also talking about uh, where, where others argue that it um, that we are not free if we're subject if we're subjected to a, a, a psychological force. Um, sometimes people are in abusive relationships, um, especially uh, uh, the type of relationships that are physically abusive or mentally abusive, right? And when you're mentally or physically and we talked about physical constraint, but also if you're mentally being abused and um, and being with, held back, you know. So how is that? How and that's on the more of a micro, and I'm talking from a micro standpoint. Um, there's other ways to psychologically influence people. Uh, we do it through our advertisement and polit political propaganda. But on a micro level, on an individual level, you can have some. You can be in a controlling relationship where you can't do things unless you get permission. Um, finally, when we talk about constraints, there's economic constraints, right? Uh, you can you can uh, you can not be truly free unless you have economic resources. That in, and so in according in this in the book, it talks about liberal democracies. It is generally accepted that the state could, should guarantee a minimum standard of living to ensure that everyone is free from the threat of starvation. So that, I mean, these are things um, when we talk about this idea of constraints, right? The state makes sure that most people, because we do have people in America, in the United States that are starving and they don't have access to the, the, the necessities of life, like eating and or even a roof over their head. Um, when we talk about uh, liberty, we're talking about there's a, uh, uh, a liberal philosopher, uh, Isaiah Berlin, argues that, um, that that liberty can be divided into two distinct concepts. The one is a negative liberty, liberty, which is argued that people should be free as possible from external influences, meaning the state should not uh, get involved. It's more, it's it's a libertarian type of concept where you know everyone should be able to pull themselves up by the bootstraps. The problem with that theory is um, in, in, a, in, in systems where there's a, a hierarchy, may it be based on race, gender, sexual orientation, religious, or even, uh, even having access where it's, it's based on uh, economics, you know, how much money your family makes and brings in. Uh, how, how is everybody going to pull themselves up by the bootstrap as um, MLK once said? One has to have boots and a strap to pull themselves up by. Okay, uh, support is a positive liberty, except the external influences which help individual fulfillment, like the state education, which is funded by our taxation. We're taxed, um, and it's not always equal, right? Every every school district is not equal, and so um, so when we talk about this positive liberty, yes, you know, through our taxation. Um, Young children, K through 12, are given education. Um, but the problem is with that theory is, again, once again, everybody's not starting off at the same place, especially when your um, when 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 you, when education or your school district's funding is based on property values of your homes. So if your house is worth a million dollars, the prop the tax on that, which the school district will get will uh, be quite significant as, as opposed to if your house was worth 200,000. Um, I know that's a little weird here in California, but even 400,000, let's compare a million or 800, 900,000 to 400,000. Again, those, that school district uh, 
is going to be the resources in that school district are going to be significantly less. Um, Berlin's distinction has been heavily criticized because um, some people argue that it's not really realistic, and 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 also there. And I put in the powerpoints that the concepts are kind of hard to distinguish sometimes. And I think it's because of this concept that, it, again, it's from this libertarian standpoint that, you know, government even should not be involved and that everybody has the same, start off at the same point, and that's not true. Um, then we have uh, Stuart, uh, John Stuart Mills and his idea of what liberty is. And his idea is liberty is, it's based off his book on liberty, which argues that maximum possible freedom on the grounds of the human advancement. Thus, for example, uh, when we talk about freedom of expression will lead to new intellectual discoveries and will actually reinforce faith um, in longstanding ideas and provide that, that they can stand up to rational discussion. Um, again, and you, we see this with, um, um, especially when it comes to religions uh, sometimes, um, when you have people who question things in, in, in religious texts, like how can, how can uh, uh, Jonah, or yeah, Jonah and the whale, well, actually, you know, how can Jonah sit in the belly of a big fish, right? Um, this makes no idea, this makes no sense, even though this is a uh, this this is a reinforcement of a tradition of faith and and mo and a lot of people and if you've gone to church, you have heard pastors use this story as a way to it's one of obedience, one of being uh, obedient and and uh, and not discriminating against a group of people. I mean, there's a lot to the story that's very positive, but but when you tell people, if you talk to an atheist, they will bring this idea that how can this story stand up to a rational discussion? How can you hold and and I mean, and I'm not going to get into all that because uh, this lecture will go from like 30, 40 minutes to six hours. And so um, I'm just using these as examples and, you know, what your belief system is, is uh, up to you. But, um, and if you believe, if you don't believe, that's up to you. I'm just, I'm just trying to, I'm, and I'm doing a disclaimer right now because I'm not, I do not want to offend anyone. Uh, when we still talk about Mills, uh, Mill and, uh, and his idea of liberty, he also talks about um, informed decisions about proper scope of liberty, uh, the harm principle, right? This distinguish between actions that affect others and those that affect just oneself. Now, um, I tend to when I look at this and and when we talk about things such as uh, 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 when one has a right to does one have a right to take their life? You know, and if you um, there's country there's a country Switzerland that you do have a right to go to Switzerland, pay a certain amount of money, and they will help you end your life. Do you have a right? And and who does that just affect oneself or does it affect uh, others? And that depends on where you're. And again, I'm only here just discussing this in the in the lecture context. I'm not here uh, telling people what they should or shouldn't. You know what I believe on this or not. But um, when we're talking about this, it's it's going to be based on your it's, it's it's subjective. It's based on your perception. One person can argue, I'm only harming myself and I should not be constrained. Others will argue, no, you're not just harming yourself, you're also harming those who love you. And okay, the big problem with Mills' theory is that it's difficult to classify any action as purely self-regarded, right? Again, the right to life. An example of this, this difficulty is a case of smoking. And in your book, um, it talks about, you know, like smoking and your liberty. You know, it, being able to smoke in public spaces, and that's you know, does it? Do you have a right? And some people would argue, well, I'm only harming myself. Others would argue, no, you're harming everybody else around you because uh, the smoke. Uh, I can take in second. I can uh, the second hand smoke does affect me also. Um, when we and, and how we apply meal is through this adopt, and when we adopt uh, Mill's theory, the state restrictions on liberty is a case of coronavirus 
and the pandemic is a great example of this. Um, when we had lockdown measures and other restrictions, as, as the state argued, those were justified, okay, because we were preventing harm for others. Regardless of what your personal belief is, I'm, the state has said, your, you cannot, we had to do lockdowns because we had to protect everybody from harm, not just your, and not just your individual right. Because like a lot of people say, well, I have a right, but the state said no. And when I say state, I'm not just talking about the federal government, I'm talking about the state government, your local governments all said, no, we got to protect everyone, not just you. It's not just about you and your individual right. Um, anyone floating these measures were behaving in an illegitimately other regarding fashion, which is true. So when you go against the state, right, when you push against back, right, um, Again, you have people go into Trader Joe's and argue with the, about wearing the mask. I shouldn't have to wear a mask. I have a right. And they, you know, they were doing all this yelling and screaming, not understanding that Trader Joe's is a private business. Yes, it, it's a business that is in the public square, but it does not, you don't get a right to just, you know, if they say you got to wear a mask, even today, if they, if they say you got to wear a mask, you have to wear a mask coming into their public business. Just like no shoes, no shirt, no service. And nobody seems to have a problem with that, you know, when it's directed at homeless people. Uh, a similar argument can be employed to justify mandatory vac vaccinations, mask wearing, assuming. And again, when we go back to the vaccinations, a lot of people lost their jobs. There's been celebrities, there's been actors. Um, I was reading an article the other day, a gentleman from a, a soap opera tried to argue his um, right, and it was Disney, and that's uh, it's through, he tried to sue Disney and the judge threw it out. He said, look, you know, they're your employer. You know, you they are the bourgeoisie class, you're the proletariat. And so therefore, when you sell yourself, you sell your time to yourself, especially when you're in an environment where like a factory or, or a warehouse or, or a soundstage where everybody's, there's a lot of people, you know, we, we can mandate that you be vaccinated. And if you're not done by this date, we have to, we're going to, we have a right to, in, you know, discontinue your contract. And that's the thing with contractual employees. The contractual employees like to argue, you know, I have a right, but the thing is, you're a contract employee. I'm a contract employee. Ventura, Ventura, uh, the Ventura Community College District mandated that I had to get a vaccination for me to come back to work here. Now, I could have stayed home and just taught online, but but if I, they don't have enough classes, then I'm going to be in trouble, right? Yeah, I would be in trouble because I mean, I wanted to come back into class, so they said, "Well, you have to." Well, we're mandating you get the vaccination. Now, regardless of how I felt about it, it's something I had to do. I had a choice to make. I didn't get to sue them. You know, I don't get to sue them, you know, and, and we can argue, but, but where is the justice in that for you? Well, individually, you might not be, I might not get a justice, but on a, on a, um, on a macro level, it's, it's, it's provides justice for other, all of us, because at the end of the day, um, you know, if I am vaccinated, if I am wearing the mask, I'm less inclined to give it to someone. And I am thank, thankfully, thank God. And I, you know, for for me, I didn't have that. I didn't have that situation. I never caught COVID, and um, because I did what what what, what the CDC and and I talked to doctors, what they told me to do, and I followed I followed the instructions. I'm not gonna sit there and no offense, I'm not gonna let uh, somebody who's not a medical professional or not a scientist tell me what they think because they heard from other people. Yeah. Um, when we talk about justice as a distributional concept, justice is concerned with distributing resources such as wealth, income and educational opportunities. This is those who believe in um, us like us, uh, like um, social, it is it is a form of socialism. That's why you call it social justice. Like we, you know, you want to make sure everyone uh, spread the wealth, so to speak. Now, not everybody believes in it, and that's okay. Especially, how does that work in a capitalistic society, right? America, the United States is is a very nuanced nation. Things are when we talk about things like um, 
discrimination. Discrimination is not always just uh, about race and it's not always just about black and white, right? It can be about many things. When we talk about things like affirmative action, most people tend to think affirmative action is about race. Really affirmative action is about more than race. It's about gender. Uh, it's about um, sexual, now it's about, it was now it had become about sexual orientation. It's become, a, it's become about, uh, about, about your, your uh, how much money your family has. So your inc economic income, most people, most people tended to look at affirmative action. And most people argue that, oh, the black person took the job from the white person, which um, that wasn't always true. In fact, um, what happened with affirmative action, if you actually read the data, the people that benefited most from affirmative action are white women. So when we make this argument, and the young lady who brought the case against the University of Texas at Austin, uh, her name is Abigail uh, Fisher, she argued, that was her argument. Um, I had a 3.5 or 3.2, I think it was like a 3.2 to 3.5. Um, she also took the SATs and she got 1,100 out of 1,600. She played, and her argument was, I play an instrument. The problem was, and what people argued, what, what the institution argued back, somebody somebody released her information. And what we, they found was that um, in Texas, because Texas had a system that they took the top 10% of students in every school district, regardless where you came from. So that means people from uh, economically depressed areas, poor communities, had also had the opportunity to go to University of, of, uh, of Texas at Austin, as well as those who come from affluent communities. So they were taking the top 10%, and it's the Texas, uh, the Texas University system, they were taking the top 10%. And um, what happened with her, once all her information came out, was they found out she wasn't ever going to be able to go because she had a 3.2. And, you know, and sh there were students who were from more economically depressed communities who were students of color who had better GPAs. But not just that, not only did they also play an instrument, but they also gave back to their community. And that's all that plays into that idea. So when we talk about these issues, um, we tend to see it usually from a, a lens like affirmative action in black and white when it's much more nuanced than that. Uh, theories of justice, I'm sorry, there's a distinction between procedural justice, the, the following the rules and social justice, which, concern, which is concerned more with the outcomes. Um, theories of justice tend to be based on the idea of consistency of treatment. Still, they can allow for different outcomes. Um, so sometimes we have a meritocrat meritocratic theory of justice would argue that people should be awarded according, according to their merits, regardless of their social background. Um, not always true, and it isn't always true. Um, sometimes it's based on who we know. The, and again, let's go back to let's go back to affirmative action in college and colleges. Um, there is from there's also a thing called legacy, and legacy is an issue where if your parents went there, then you go there. That, uh, that is also a form of affirmative action. Well, a lot of institutions are starting to get rid of the, of the legacy. Now, those in favor of it argue that, well, it takes away from, the, from those who have historically gone here and they give money, they donate to the school. Well, MIT has never had a legacy type of system. MIT, um, uh, they don't do a legacy system and they have a, they, their donors, they donate upwards of, uh, they have, they have upwards of $25 billion of donations that have been donated to the institution. So this idea that, that, that you, that those whose parents went there, and let's be clear, when we talk about legacy, 70% uh, of those who are uh, legacy students are from white families. And so that is also a form of affirmative action, you know, so that, and, it, and, and there's the data is out there so we can uh, read up on the data and um, look at it. But again, whenever, and this lets me know what's going on in our society when we have, when those in power tend to always use uh, race of black versus white or straight versus gay and not really get to the root of what's really going on. That just tells me they're trying to distract those um, the majority from uh, coming together and really trying to solve these problems. 
Another example of that is mass shootings. Um, when we talk about mass shootings, mass shootings is this concept that if I say mass shootings, what are what are the most, um, uh, if you look at mass shootings, who does most of the mass shootings? I bet you out of most, most of you guys are thinking white men. Nope, that's not, that's not the answer I'm looking for. How about we just start at men, take out the white and just say men tend to do mass shootings. But once we start, once we put this concept of color, what does that do? It, it, sh it shuts down the conversation because white men don't want to hear about it. They don't want to hear that. Especially when, when if we just get a, get rid of the white, because the fact is the pulse shooter was not white, you know the um, the uh, the the New York subway shooter was not white. I mean, there's we can you know the mass shooting at Virginia Tech, another non-white, but all these that I said, the uh, San Bernardino shooting at Christmas a few years ago was not white, and there was a woman who was involved in that, but she was with her husband. But the four I brought up that were not white, uh, uh, four fifths of them were men. And if we look up mass shootings, you're gonna find majority of mass shootings are done by men. And so then, but we never get that far. We never get to the root of the problem because we're too busy uh, looking for looking at color and wanting to use color as a reason to you know, tear, bring, I guess, distract, tear people down and distract um, when we talk about John Rawls, he's also a political uh, American political theorist. Um, he he argued in his book a, a theory of justice that people were unaware of their position in society would agree that social and economic inequality should only be allowed to the extent that they benefit society as a whole. Um, all offices should be uh, all offices should be open to free and fair competition. That's what he argued. Now, now it seems very uh, 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 altruistic. It, it seems very altruistic to me. And when we uh, look at this, um, he would also argue that people should have an equal right to freedom, provided that this was comparable with the freedom of others. This drew attention to possible conflicts between justice and freedom. Because if you look at the United States, um, not everybody has all the same freedoms as other people. I'm sorry. Um, and if you have a lot of money, <laughs> people with a lot of money have a lot more freedom than you, right? And so um, what do you do? What do we do? How do you handle these things? And so, and so when we talk about um, men have more freedom than women, and men do, and, that, and that's the reality, that's true about, us as a society, men have more freedoms than women do. Uh, a good example is when women walk out to their cars at night, right? Women have to go through a process because uh, it's an issue of safety for women. And for men, a lot of times we just walk out to our car. Now there's, there's, there's criticisms of roles, right? Uh, uh, some people have said, um, that because of uh, because there were some people argue that because the it's it's you imagining a scenario which his principles of justice arise and deep is deeply implausible. So they argued that they were not real. And although he allows uh, individuals in his scenario to be uh, to be of self interest, he overlooks the possibility of, that they would be risk takers. Um, so so it's this idea that everybody first of all everybody's not the same. Some people take more risk than others. Uh, some of us as individuals, we need our day planned out. You know, uh, one of the hardest things I, I, I find for students is when they come into my class and they find out I do assignments on a week, I just do it on a week to week basis because I teach political science. Um, and polit political science is a current event, it's a current event topic. Things happen all the time in our political system, hence the hot topic. Things are happening all the time. Things are happening right now, you know, as I'm talking to you in this, in this lecture. But but um, but the reality is that that when we as as a political scientist and and when I'm teaching these courses, students like to get ahead. Some students want, well, I like to be a head professor, and I have to tell them, no, you're not going to get ahead because 
Um, one thing it gets confusing for me, especially when I'm teaching multiple classes at multiple schools, and you're asking me a question about an assignment, and you're on week eight, and I'm just lecturing on week five, and you're asking me a question, because I've allowed you to get ahead, you're asking me a question, I don't know what you're talking about, because I'm I, my brain isn't there. So what I've, and in the beginning, when I started teaching, I would do that, I would let students get ahead, and it would just totally, it, it would, I would get confused, and I would tell them, to, I would give them misinformation, because they're way, they're too far ahead. So what I have to do is say, tell students, and I do tell students, if you finish your work for the week, some weeks you have more work than others. And so um, if you finish the work for the week, spend it with your family, spend it with your loved ones. We just got through a pandemic. And it, it's important that we spend it, spend time with our loved ones, because one thing we've learned is tomorrow's not always promised to everybody, okay? And so there's more criticisms of, of Rawls, uh, Robert uh, Nozick argued despite that Rawls is apparent attachment to liberty, he allows too much potential scope for state intervention. He's argued, so this idea of taxation and redistribu redistribution of wealth from the rich to the poor, Nozick was, to Nozick was totally against this. You know, um, this concept of, you know, and, and again, this, I, this socialistic idea of, or even a Marxist idea of redis wealth redistribution. You know, uh, socialism doesn't, uh, in the sense of, of, doesn't take it as quite as far as um, Marxism or communism does, but but even those systems are not completely, the wealth is so distrib distributed to, uh, from the rich to the poor, because if you look at China today, China is a, is a politically communistic Marxist society, but economically it's, it, it, it kind of functions off a of capitalistic uh, uh, system. And in how you know this is China has the second largest billionaires, number of billionaires in the world that are out of China. So how does that work in the system where wealth has been redistributed distributed to the poorer classes? And so um, uh, we have alternative theories of justice, like green theories of justice extend the principles of justice from human beings to animals. They also introduced the idea of justice between generations, arguing that people must consider the rights of those yet to be born. For example, we must pass on an environment that has not been polluted beyond all hope of recovery. And that's something we're dealing with right now, right? And this is so, so when we talk about justice and ideas of justice, um, justice, everybody's gonna have a, a different idea of, of liberty and justice. Some people, again, like, like when we first started this lecture, um, there is, there are people, there are those out there that say justice and liberty are interchangeable. Others will argue sometimes some one person's justice might come at somebody else's liberty. And so I want to um, thank you for taking the time to listen to this lecture this week. I want you guys all to uh, have a great week and I will see you next week. Bye bye.